So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this ASFP webinar. Um, we'll just wait for a couple of minutes while everyone that's trying to dial in dials in, and then we'll start our, our main event, a webinar about the insurance landscape uh, from Daniel White of Consort. We'll see you in a minute. Okay, uh, it looks like the attendees numbers um, plateaued out and, and sorted itself out. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is the, the latest ASFP webinar. We're delighted to invite uh, Daniel White of Consort along to uh, do the presentation this lunchtime. Yeah. So how today is going to work? Um, it's the, it's our usual ASFP um, platform. So I'll do a quick, I'm going to do a quick welcome. We have a questions box, a question and answer box, which we will, it, please, if you've got any questions for Daniels, we'll go through, please do that. Um, we've got a chat box if, if anybody wants, and I'll keep an eye on both of those as, as Dan does his presentation. Uh, once Dan's done his presentation, hopefully there'll be some time for some Q&A and we will... Uh, take that accordingly. The good news is for those of you that our webinar has been accredited um, for one CPD point, one hour CPD. Um, and so if you do want a CPD certificate, please uh, email info at asfp.org.uk and we can sort that out for you. I would point out, as always, that we can do that if you're online now, today at noon on the 27th of March 2024. We will record this and we will put this up on the ASFP platform with um, Daniel's permission. And if we do that and you're watching it on Catch Up TV, you can't get the one hour CPD, I'm afraid. OK. And having said all that, I'm now going to hand over to... Um, Daniel from Consort. Daniel, if you're there. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'll I'll hand over. They'll let you take control of, of the screen and away you go. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, we're all good there, aren't we, Andrew? Yeah, we're good. You're up. You you you're on the screen now. Yeah, okay, good start. Um, well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, the purpose of today's session really is just to try and provide some insight to you as to what's happening in the insurance market and what's been happening, um, then focusing on some, some crucial levels of covers. But my name is Daniel White. I'm the Sales Director of Consort. We've been working with the SFP for um, 18 months or so now um, and their membership, and really we're here to try and provide some education and, and any advice you might need. As for a bit more of a thorough detail for what we're going through today, um, the very first point will just be a little bit more about consult, nothing too heavy, um, talking to you about the insurance market. So questions that we've had to face over the recent years when things have been hardening, um, you know, why, uh, why are premiums going up, why are covers changing, all those kind of elements, hopefully give you some background to that, some context. And then dipping into to two elements of cover. Um, the first being understanding professional indemnity, um, how that works, um, the way it works with insurers, the claims basis, and then actually this one probably most important, I think, for most ASAP members, and that will be around understanding efficacy, what that means, where it sits in a programme, um, and why it's crucial for you guys to consider the cover. The next one's working in bone and finally subcontractors, something that's um, necessary for some businesses, not necessarily as much for others, but what it means within your insurance programme and why it's important to, to address the, the insurer requirements. And I'll give you some claim examples as well. So when something goes wrong, which sections of which policies and programmes respond? And then what's next? Uh, the question, second question we always get will be the market's change. When does it change back? When do things become a bit more palatable? So we've got some ideas as to when we think that'll be. Um, although that is a changing situation month by month, but for the moment, only an improvement. And then there will be a, a Q&A section at the end. So by all means, pop some questions in the, in the box during the presentation and I'll answer whatever I can at the end. So consult, who are consult? So we've been trading since 2013. Uh, we're an independent insurance brokerage. 
Uh, our presence in the fire sector really kicked off more significantly from, from 2019 um, as a result of a couple of clients that we had at that point in time that was facing some of those significant challenges that, that many of you probably have already. We set about building an insurer facility, so the, the ability to right cover with an insurer on an exclusive basis, just for consort, just for the, those that we perceive um, um, need the best support from insurers. And we label that as an insurance product called Protection Detection, or PAD for short. Um, and we've now got, um, had to do a count this morning, 84 clients in, in the PAD space that we've built. And uh, we're the trusted insurance advisor and insurance partner to the FIA, the SFP, and then most recently was at, was with the IFSM just for Christmas. So if any of you have joined for previous webinars with the SFP or perhaps a different, the um, the approach to the last year at the Fire Safety Show, some of the content today might be familiar, but it's always good to recap. So the insurance market. Uh, like many industries and marketplaces, uh, the insurance market has really moved uh, moves around in cycles. Uh, and the last hard market, which we are now coming out of, and I wouldn't say we're out of yet, but we're coming out of. Oh, sorry, put my own face there. Um, the last hard market was in the early 2000s. Uh, and the UK has really traditionally been seen as a, as a good investment opportunity uh, for foreign investors. And essentially that means foreign investors providing the capacity to insure us to write business, giving them the money and ability to go and write business and then pay claims if they need to. They see the UK as a good opportunity um, for investment for a number of different reasons, um, but there are probably two most predominantly significant factors. Uh, the first of those is that we lack um, significant natural disasters, you know, just hurricanes, a bit flooding, although obviously we still have some. Uh, and then the second one is that the, the litigious nature of our society. So the UK um, isn't too bad. It's getting worse, I guess, over time, you could say. But when you try and compare what is a similar economy, maybe not time to size, but in terms of the way it trades in the market, you've got the US, you have lots of disasters, we'll sue each other more. You've got the UK with less disasters and less cases go to court. So for that reason, it's, it's seen as a good opportunity for people to, uh, businesses to invest. Um, we, there's a couple of things that, that change over time. So re realistically, when you've got lots of capacity being provided to insurers, you then create a really healthy competition. Healthy competition essentially means, by and large, that insurers are fighting on premium to win business. You know, who can provide the most competitive terms with the most competitive cover, which the latter isn't always achieved. Um, but the negative effects really is only, are only ever seen in the long term, not the short term, but certainly the long term when we've got insurers just trying to be the most competitive they can against the numbers to win business. So why the market hardens? Um, that comes down to a number of different factors, but there are things like uh, claims start to materialise over the course of time, which cannot be predicted because a large job for insurers and actuaries, if you remember that term, the people that sit behind the, the premiums, people try and predict what they can with num numbers, um, means that there are claims that happen that are completely freak accidents that are unable, insurers are unable to predict for. And you also see changes in legislation. So government attempts to, um, well, not attempts to will force the market to react in different ways. One of those was a thing called the opt-in discount. Um, Act uh, a few years ago now, which essentially said to insurers, the way you compensate people who have been seriously injured now has to change drastically. So overnight, insurers' own premiums um, and the reserves that they were keeping were completely thrown out. Mathematicians had a nightmare, and essentially, government said you need to be better. All of those things are the, uh, well out of control for insurers. So, and then the, the next one is the significant events. You know, and for, for the fire sector, and we we're all well aware of what that would be, Renfell, um, a huge impact in the market, um, essentially mean that where we had lots of insurers before providing capacity, lots of insurers decided to leave um, the market at that point in time. And when they leave, at least those remaining, I mean, they have to insure more businesses um, and then really start to create what would then be called a hard market. So a the, the final factor, the most recent one, really economic wise, is just around um, inflation. You know, we've seen inflation is now steadying, but where it was going 10, 12% year on year, all of those kinds of things factor into the type of money that an insurer needs to, leave, needs to leave in their reserves. So that brings about the hard market. And then when we get back through to the a softer market, which is where we were pushing towards now, is essentially back around to the beginning. More insurers come in, but I'll be touching upon that a bit later on as well. 
So first indemnity, we'll start by just identifying what first indemnity actually is, just in the most broad sense possible, really. So first indemnity is a standalone policy, but you can find it in a subsection of your insurance programme, depending on who your insurer is. But regardless of the placement, it covers the legal costs and expenses incurred in your defence, as well as any costs awarded if you are alleged to have provided inadequate advice, services or designs that predominantly cause your client to lose money. So when a business purchases a professional indemnity policy, you're purchasing a contract and an insurance policy is a contract. Uh, it's, it's often said to me by, by, by friend and family and people that I work on side that they feel insurers are looking for reasons not to pay claims. I understand that point of view, but an insurance policy is a contract. So you purchase a contract that guarantees insurers will pay out in the event of a set of circumstances occurring. With professional indemnity, this is why it's quite different because this, these set of circumstances are not just a claim event itself. For cover to be granted, policyholders need to have acted in the correct way after the loss arises, and we refer to those same conditions. And so, an, an example, and you will see some of these later on in the presentation, um, but an incident could trigger professional indemnity policy perfectly. So it's clearly visible, policyholder has made an error in their professional responsibilities and that causes their customer or a claimant against them some financial loss. But if you've not acted correctly following the loss with the process, you need to notify the insurer about an incident to allow them to be the, um, the financial compensator, then cover can be rejected. It's a really important element. Professional indemnity limits. So when we consider the effects to the PI, um, some of the most drastic changes during the higher market phase, uh, aside from premium implications and adaptations or dilutions of cover, have been changes to how PR programs need to be built, uh, as well as how limits of indemnity can be provided on policy and, and how they are supplied by the insurer. So on the left here, we see 5 million limit indemnity prior to higher market, and you can still find it now, but the principle being that prior to the higher market, you could approach an insurer by your broker and say, okay, I need five million pounds of a cover. That insurer would say, yeah, here's the premium, provided it meets the risk criteria, here's the premium. Um, but what really happened in the hard market is that where we had that reducing in capacity, reducing in appetite, the insurers that remain said, okay, I want to spread some of this risk. I don't want to write five million pounds worth of cover now. Instead, I'd like to either join as the primary insurer, which means insurer A from this list, that sits right at the front with if there is a claim, but they wouldn't want to be insuring anything beyond that. Or they would join as an excess layer insurer, which is insurer B or insurer C, which essentially means they want to be further up the chain in the event that a claim happens. So typically, you'd have the one insurer providing the 5 million. When the harder market came, the changes in appetite from insurers, it's really now quite commonplace to see three, at least three insurers on a 5 million placement. Um, and what's really important about when the market changed is, is identifying the insurers that had appetite to sit in the right places. We've got instances with our client set that there might be three different policies needed, like here, where we've got the primary one, the excess of two, and the excess of another two, creating a five, where actually we've got six or seven different insurers taking different shares across that. So it's crucial that the broker, your broker is talking to you about different structures of policies, um, how, how limits are supplied, where the appetite sits with different insurers. Uh, and most crucially, most crucially, when we're coming through now this, this harder market and lights at the end of the tunnel, is identifying the, the right insurers that are going to be around for, for the foreseeable future that can be able to write the policy and entering uh, at a, a competitive premium. And then a really big fundamental difference um, that this left side um, doesn't address but the right side does is in previously where five million limit indemnity is supplied traditionally um, would have been on an any one claim basis and that essentially meaning if you had touch wood you wouldn't but if you had 50 claims over an insurance period um, and each one of those was five million pounds you would have been covered under any one claim the massive change to the market where again it was driven by the reduction in appetite for insurers because very few remained was a shift to aggregate basis, which is monumental. So that same principle of 50 claims, again, touch wood, wouldn't have happened to anyone. But that the principle of those 50 claims now means you've got a five million limit across the whole policy period, regardless as to how many claims are made. So any one claim to aggregate, massive change. Lots of businesses have been through the pain of that. Um, the requirement to negotiate around contractual um, obligations that you've made in the past. 
but there are some fixes to it. Uh, fixes are certainly what we've been putting in place where we can. Um, but as you'd expect, they probably do come at some cost. The fixes can be a reinstatement option on an aggregate policy, which essentially means that provided the negotiations have happened prior to the renewal or placement of a policy, reinstatement can be put, on, put into place, which essentially means if you get to that five million limit, each of the insurers on the left there will say, OK, we'll go back to the start again if we need to, and we pay an extra premium to do so. Um, typically speaking, um, although this is again changing quite often now, is that it will add about 20 to 30 percent additional premium to your PI spend to include a reinstatement option. You can have different reinstatement options. Um, so you can have a single reinstatement, which I mean, these all sound quite self explanatory, but if you exhaust your limit, you can go around again and you can go around once more. So it essentially gives you 5 million cover and then another 5 million cover. You can have three times or you can have unlimited, which essentially says, OK, we've got five million, up to 5 million for anyone playing and then we'll go back around again and back around again, back around again. That's been the fix for a lot of different businesses where anyone claims not really achievable and to win business, to maintain contracts that have got in force. Reinstatement has been, has been a handy tool for that, but obviously it comes at some cost. So the claims basis. More information on PI in here, which I appreciate if, if it's something that might be relatively new to you, it's a lot of information to take in. So please do ask any questions if it's unclear. But I'll move on to the claims made basis now. Um, Press indemnity works on a claims made basis, which means it covers claims that are made and reported during the policy period only and not once the policy period is over. Your previous insurer will no longer accept the claim if you have moved provider. So as long as your broker has endorsed your policy with a retroactive date, which I'll come on to shortly, um, that enables you the best opportunity to have cover confirmed, but you still have to notify your current insurer as soon as you become aware. So I'll try and use this timeline to hopefully make a little bit more sense of that. Um, so on the 1st of June 2020, you complete works for a contract whilst insurer A is on cover. However, the claims incident has not come to light until the 1st of June 2021. So it's something you did last year, but something you found out about it today. It's insurer B that responds, despite the fact that insurer A was on cover when something happened. It's when you notify the insurer that responds. That's what claims made makes claims made basis means. And this will be important shortly because I'll talk you through how um, a liability policy is different. So retroactive date, very simple. This is the date that should be shown on your insurance schedule, which is essentially the front page or second page of the most important document for PI. Um, in most instances, it should reflect the time, the first time the business purchased the PI policy because then it enables the cover back to that date in time. Um, or it could be if you're on an acquisition trail or when the business was purchased. There's lots of different nuances for it, but essentially it should be the first time you purchased the business. The uh, first time you purchased the policy, I'm sorry. You know, sometimes we see um, different versions of this. Um, it can be lots of different reasons. We can see something that says none on insurance schedule, which is more than likely to be good, but it could also mean that a broker has not told your insurer to endorse the policy appropriately with the correct retroactive date, which is a bit of an own goal because it's a, it's a simple clerical item to do. Um, the, it's a, if a broker has not paid enough attention and put an incorrect retroactive date, or just use the, the policy period that they have moved to a new insurer from. So, you know, your new policy started yesterday on a renewal. The retroactive date was incorrectly set as yesterday. In the event that a claim comes to light for something that happened last year, six years, eight years, a long time ago, without that retroactive date being correct, a claim would be rejected. There are some circumstances where a broker could negotiate with the insurer, but it would not be something to rely on. It's a very simple thing to get right. It doesn't cost more money. It's not a case of, right, okay, we need to make sure we put the right retroactive date on and how much is that going to cost us. It makes no difference to premium because insurers should accept that they will cover you back to the previous date. So my top tip, check your retroactive date, make sure it's correct. We see it incorrect too often, not Frequently, it's not like it's one in two, but if it's one in four, that's still too much. So contractual obligations, um, I mentioned that previously. So generally speaking, when you enter a tender, when you win a piece of work, businesses, your clients will obviously stipulate that you need to carry the level of cover that they need. 
there's changes to how this is working as a result of the Building Safety Act um, and the, the, term, the time that um, you can be pursued for um, negligent advice. Um, typically on any, the most common time period previously has been 12 years. And that essentially means your clients say to you, you need to buy this policy for this amount of time, you need to be able to buy a PI for 12 years after the completion of the contract, which is really important because of this claim made basis. That means that they, you can make a claim well after the fact, so that your clients need you to carry cover well after the fact in line with that. Obviously, the changes in the market when policies became too expensive and changes in colour, this is where the issue was for many. So something to bear in mind that when you're taking on a new uh, tender, a new contract, a new client, if they say to you, right, okay, you're carrying 5 million cover, I need you to carry 10 million on PI, that might seem like an appealing prospect, but if that means you then need to carry that for 12 more years after completion, that can be a seriously considerable spend. So always speak to your broker about it first, see if there's a way to defend or negotiate that down to five years, um, and then just see just for five million, as well as negotiating the period that you need to carry it for, for afterwards. Something to bear in mind, just as a last point on this slide, is that the person that arranges the insurance within the business um, generally changes hands. You know, it can be a finance director, it can be an account person. It wouldn't be, there are, there are, it can move responsibility within the business based on requirement at the time. And if you've got someone new to handling your insurances in your business, but they aren't aware of the pre previous contractual obligations, there's always a bit of a risk that they may affect changes in the program that they aren't aware that affect previous contractual obligations. So if the insurance swap, swaps hands in business to arrange a renewal for the year, just make sure that we're uh, as reasonably aware as they can be to make sure cover limits are maintained. So that's it on um, fresh indemnity. We'll touch upon it later on on a couple of things, but that's the coverage as a whole. But please do feel free to pop in some questions. I've chucked a lot on the wall there um, and I understand it, it, it might be perhaps too much detail. But what I move on to now is efficacy um, and why that's important. So efficacy, this provides cover. Um, it's a legal liability for injury to third parties or damage to third party property uh, arising from a product failing to perform its intended function. That's, that's the most important phrase that I think you could, I would say, take away from today if you aren't familiar with efficacy. Um, it goes by different names, which is why we don't cover ourselves in glory as an industry for it. It can be done as fairly as before, which is, you'd argue, a lot more straightforward. Um, efficacy, inefficacy. Um, it's not a standalone policy. It will fall, fall within your public and product liability section of a program so you can't go out and buy efficacy on its own your broker has to approach the right insurers who are able to provide efficacy within that liability policy so how does efficacy look on your policy set and you'll see a slide from me shortly which um, demonstrates how difficult it is to get that right um, because it can show as a silent wording or an explicit wording Probably maybe somewhat self-explanatory, but silent wording uh, means cover is not explicitly excluded. So insurers don't say you are not covered for this. And when that happens, which is our preference as a business to write policies that way, um, you are not covered for this. So they say you are not covered for this, means you're not covered. If it's silent, the insurer just accepts that provided you've given the information to allow them to evaluate your risk, then they say, yep, yeah, okay, comfortable with that. We're just not writing out the cover. It's included on a silent basis. The flip side of that um, is an explicit wording where an insurer will say you are covered for efficacy. But what we find is that where explicit wordings are preferable to some, um, but not to us, preferable to some is that it then provides limitations to cover too, because it might be you are you are covered for efficacy under XYZ, as opposed to just a blanket silent wording, you are covered. So the claims basis, and it's very the same slide as last time. Um, in terms of timelines, just to try and demonstrate this a bit more. So as you might remember, first indemnity uh, was a claims made basis, efficacy and any liability claim, in truth, is on a claims occurring basis. So it's very, very different. Same, same incident. So a claim incident on the 1st of June uh, 2020, you've installed um, classifier product, a fire curtain, um, it's failed to perform its intended function. And then it's not come down, fire spread, damage to property, injury to person, which is when, if you aren't carrying efficacy, if you 
assume you'd have insurer support but, and you don't have very efficacy, you would not. Um, but so 1st of June 2021 is when it gets notified to insurer, even though the incident happened in 1st of June 2020. Oh, sorry, too many clicks. So, yeah, if something happened 1st of June, you notify your insurer 1st of June 2021. It sounds like a year period might be crazy to notify an insurer because you haven't been made aware. But actually, it's not as uncommon as you might think because your client might repair the building and, and then come to you for costs afterwards. Someone's injury might not come to light until well after the fact, um, all sorts of different reasons. But where we had the PI basis of, okay, it's the insurer at the time of the notification, this is totally different. It's the insurer A that responds. So the incident happened back then. We tell the, we find out later on and tell the insurers, but it's the insurer that you were insured with at the time of the loss, not the time of the notification. Hopefully that makes sense. Again, please do ask questions on that if you need to. So working with bona fide subcontractors. Um, the, it's a tricky one, this, because there are businesses that need um, a substantial network to complete their work because they are, if you like, more turnkey. They will complete active work, the passive work. They may have multidisciplines within the business and need to be supported, or they might not. Um, they might just be a, a business that relies more on a direct workforce. But a bona fide subcontractor in the eyes of insurers um, is uh, an independent entity that's contracted to perform work on a project and is not subject to the control and direction of the contractor. So LOSC, so I'm using that acronym in there, um, labour only subcontractor and a bona fide subcontractor. This is just a little bit of a handy list that we put together to try and help clients distinguish where the two sit because they are separate from an insurance perspective. Um, but the principle being labour and subcontractors, they will use your tools, they will use your materials, they would more than likely be told when to um, take lunch breaks, um, they would fall under your rounds. Bona fide, flip side of all of that. They're likely to have their own insurances, they bring their own workforce, they like to use their own tools, they may use your materials, um, but they will be on and off site without close control and they're bought into a specific job set. What you will have, where it's been pointed out, pointed out clearly enough over time, is um, a subcontractor's insurance condition, which says if you're working with bona fide subcontractors, you need to make sure that you, they have cover in force. Um, and where this is very specific to the fire sector is the second point here, if I can find this. Yeah, just here. So point number two. Um, the condition itself says, yeah, you need to carry a fire million level of cover. And if you're, you've hired a bona fide subcontractor who is working on um, safety critical products, they should be maintaining efficacy within their own program as well. So when a claim happens, something goes wrong, damage to property, injury to person, your insurer would respond in the first instance because you're subcontracting the work out. All they will say is, who completed the work? Okay, it was subcontractor X. And they say, okay, well, did you check their insurances? Have they got the right cover? And yet they might have five million limit of a limit of liability, but if they don't have efficacy, you run the real risk of the insurer um, refusing to to handle the claim on your behalf, and the subcontractor's insurer would not, likely not respond as well if they haven't arranged their policy. So, this subcontractor's insurance condition really important to pay close attention to it, and then also to pay close attention to your subcontractor insurances. There are challenges with that, which you should be supported with your broker by, um, and you'll see these on the next slide. So the challenges are for perhaps smaller businesses that you know might be one man, two man, three man, five man bands, so to speak, um, will be a lack of understanding that they aren't necessarily always given the same opportunity to loan covers are required, like this webinar, from their broker because they might be more inclined to find cover online because there are some options, lots of options to do so. So the lack of understanding from subcontractors, and that, that's not to say that they um, are doing so willingly, but that lack of understanding then means that policies are arranged inappropriately as opposed to on purpose. There are cost implications to arranging the right cover. Um, you can go online. I've seen them all manner of, manners of them where you can find a policy for bonding pack you know, just picking a figure out, yeah. But realistically, if you're working in the, in the safety critical space of the fire sector, you need to have a more appropriate policy 
more appropriate policy does mean more premium. Not substantially. It's not a case of right where they spent four hundred, they need to spend two thousand pounds at all. But it is about making sure the um, the cover's right, and then the premium attached to it is inevitable. And then the third one is finding cover. To be honest, so um, you know, if you can imagine a smaller business. Where do I go for my insurance? I'll tap into Google. Completely reasonable. It's exactly what I would do. But finding the right people to talk about the company. And you might call a call centre. And with all due respect, I worked in one when I was 18, 19, selling car insurance um, 15 years ago. So I've been there. I've done that. But you might call a call centre for your business insurance. And there's, there's just very little opportunity or likelihood that the people you speak to there would be able to offer you very specific advice for what is a niche sector. And the next part is this. So what I've done is I've just pulled out a few different excerpts from um, subcontractors' insurances that we check on our clients' behalf. So where I mentioned before that you should have your broker support, when you get those subcontractor insurances in, pass it to your broker and ask them for their professional opinion because it's precisely what they're there for. So these are some excerpts from that. And I pulled these out because these are all quite different. Um, and they're all quite different, which makes it even more challenging for your subcontractors, makes it even more challenging for you, and makes it even more challenging for brokers. Start with the one on the right. Um, granted, this is around alarm installers, um, as a couple of these are actually, but you will see, in respect of your alarm installers business, we will not indemnify your legal liability in respect of work other than on, and those are fine, because you think, right, okay, someone could be working just in those places, but if they're working anymore, you'd have to be there. Um, you'd have to adapt the policy. But the most important part here is just this little one line that insurers put in here, the failure of the product to perform its intended function. So they won't provide you cover um, in the event that something's gone wrong there, where the product's not done what it says on the tin, which is crucial. Um, and this would be this particular one, I think it was page five of the schedule, is tucked in amongst lots of other different clauses, which is precisely where our industry does not do itself any favours whatsoever. And on the left is just more examples of that. Um, the, you see this is number 12 on this one, and the first one at the top, removal of colour for failure of alarms. This was endorsement 12 of 15, 20. Um, efficacy exclusion, again, different terminologies being used, makes it tricky, to, this makes it a minefield. Again, partial failure or failure, being not doing the thing it's supposed to. Uh, alarm installation, efficacy exception, again, Crazy wording. And this particular one was even more challenging. So I found this in page, I think, something like 62 of a policy wording. So it's not even in the first few pages of an insurance document that provides the primary limits of cover and, and the basic information. It's tucked away in a policy wording, which, you know, I can be reasonably confident that I haven't had a client that sat through and read 90 pages of policy wording. Um, that's our job as a broker to point these things out. But this just gives you a really practical examples of how things look so differently, how they can appear, the wording is so differently, locations and policies so differently. So this is why we see the subcontractor network and how it should be managed is really crucial to making sure that a business um, can do what it can trade the way it needs to with, within the network. So a few claim examples for you. Um, these will be what the insured is alleged to have done wrong. Alleged is a really important word because when you have a claim, it can just be uh, people alleging. It doesn't necessarily mean that the business has acted um, negligently, um, but then also touching upon what the specific costs are being recovered. So scenario, scenario one, uh, the insured contested the installation methods of the lead contractor. Um, this was around fire detection and alarm systems again. So BS5839, yep, uh, BS5839. The, the, the lead contractor, uh, the subcontractor, my client in this instance, um, contested that what they were doing was, was not going to be fit for purpose, would have protected property, might endanger your lives. So this is quite a unique scenario here, but it was a breach of contract alleged. Um, and the policy that responded there was fresh indemnity because the lead contractor said, you cost me money, they pursued the client, it went to court and there was ended up being a settlement, although nowhere near what the lead contractor was pursuing for. So quite a unique claim example there, just to throw a span in the works early on. Scenario two, false activation of the fire alarm. Um, same principle here could be um, a, a passive fire product, but led to, an, it led to an economic loss for downtime. This was actually just a restaurant. It wasn't a particularly big claim, but it said, look, my fire alarm's going off. 
incessantly throughout Saturday night. I can't keep bringing people in and out. I've had to credit everyone with this. It's cost me a few thousand pounds. This was your fault for not fitting the fire on properly. Uh, and the policy responded there was first indemnity because of that that economic loss from a third party. There was no damage to the property, no one was injured. So that responded. Scenario three, um, leaking sprinklers at the top of the high res high rise residential block of flats, leading to damage of subsequent floors below. The alleged was an incorrect install, um, and the incorrect install led to a failure of the product before it was intended function. Cover responded with efficacy within the liability program because it did that damage to a property. Scenario four, the installed water mist system deemed not fit for purpose, fire broke out for initial point discovery to cause further damage. Um, not particularly large claim again, but something that uh, obviously um, needed to ensure a response. So the, the, the couple of different things, and actually it's a good point for all, all four, and why a robust insurance program, program is needed, why you need a liability program, program of efficacy, why you need fresh indemnity, is that sometimes, and um, quite often, different sections of cover can respond in your defence. So you've got fresh indemnity that says, um, cover you for the loss of a third party, and then you've got efficacy under liability that says, okay, the property's been damaged. So you can have some exceptions to this. You can have liability policies that have financial loss extensions, which are can be appropriate, but not enough. Um, but essentially carrying both levels of cover just give you that, that really robust approach that business should be should be taken on. Scenario three, um, sprinkler again. Um, sprinklers failed to work during small fire industrial warehouse for resulting fire damage, failure to perform its intended function. Covers to respond to BFC. So I'll just give you a few different examples um, and just the uniqueness of that TDI icon. Sorry, the uniqueness of these claims are that we don't know what's going to happen when someone when something goes wrong. Um, when legal teams are involved and claims are made, then everyone has to be pulled into a claim. Everything is thrown at the wall to see what sticks. So yeah, there are an infinite number of variables with claims um, realistically. So Carrying a robust insurance program certainly should help you. So, who should consider the first indemnity? Um, I've just put together a little sort of vendor diagram for this, but I'll start with manufacturers. Um, if you design a product, if you test on products, if you rely on the test of those products to sell the product, for some reason those tests aren't correct, been interpreted differently by you, all of those carry an inherent PR risk, particularly for designing something, especially. Um, I'm not saying it's a, the, the the predominant level of cover that every manufacturer should be carrying, but it, it's certainly, you know, if you're creating judgments for your product use in an environment, that leaves you to expose in the event that something goes wrong. It doesn't mean you've made a mistake, but it's back to that what has been alleged scenario. Um, contractors and consultants. So I'll link these two together just on that side because they can both put forward various solutions for discussions. You know, you can accompany something with pros and cons. You're using professional judgment, which is what professional indemnity is for. You're stating pros and cons. You're interpreting test results to, to apply to an applicable scenario. That mean you might have to think ad hoc on site, which is, uh, which is reasonable. Insurers don't expect you to not make professional judgments because they expect you to be professionals in what you do. So when you're making those recommendations, um, certainly needed. Uh, as I mentioned previously, conducting those tests, um, using the data from those tests, the professional recommendations, um, that, the, that can be a blend between manufacturers and con contractors. Um, the engineers, consultants, surveyors, that in itself, fundamental consultant surveyor, everyone that is involved in that sector would absolutely be comfortable with the principle they need fresh indemnity. Um, if they aren't, then please let me know and we can talk to the rest why that's crucial. Predominantly, the fresh indemnity will, will always be required by your clients and the limits you purchase are predominantly led by contractual obligations. We do have clients that prefer to ensure that level is comfortable for them, this is about contractual obligations. And sometimes it will be that actually we don't disclose to clients what the full limits are because it's just something the business takes as an additional measure to be safe. So who should consider efficacy? So contractors that install or maintain any safety critical product. I mean, I could, I, I could, I'd like to make that bigger on this page because I do meet different businesses that will say, we haven't had it, we're okay. I, it's not something broker pointed out, I'm comfortable with the risk. But if you're doing something with a safety critical product, if you're installing it 
and someone installs it incorrectly, you'll be covered if it falls off the wall and hits someone on the head, because that would be the liability aspect. But if the fire curtain doesn't come down, if the um, compartmentation doesn't do what it should, then there will be a claim. Um, and there will be, then you would hope for the insurer's support. So I can't make that first point clear enough here. Manufacturers that design products or manufacturers from, from another's design. Um, this always feels a little bit, I see less inclination from manufacturers to carry efficacy. But for me, it's always back to that incident of something goes wrong, legal teams are involved. They've said that you manufactured a product or you supplied a product uh, as a wholesaler. This was your fault. It probably wasn't your fault. But the time it takes to resolve a serious claim, and if we use grandfather's example, and that will take years, the time it takes to resolve a serious claim means money, means legal defence costs. So for an appropriate policy from a manufacturer shouldn't be exceedingly expensive. But what it should do is give you the comfort that you've got an insurer support on your side in the event you need it to defend your position and simply keep pushing the claim to the correct party because you don't want to be left involved in a claim scenario without insurer um, support and having to use your own legal costs because they can be extortion over a long period of time. I mentioned that there previously anyway, but suppliers or distributors of safety critical products it's that whole thing, you're in a chain. Um, you may, and I see from time to time, suppliers that will, uh, on their own website, suggest different products that should be used together, which is completely reasonable because the product themselves lend themselves to that. But when, you, when you're doing so, you're then opening up that, that opportunity for someone to, to come to you in the event of a claim. So again, it's worst case scenario, but efficacy should be covered under there. Um, and then just a final point, really, um, across Best indemnity, way efficacy needed in a liability program. Um, if you're using professional judgment, um, then you absolutely should be considering to carry both of these levels of cover. Um, and with any combination of these types of businesses working together, actually, especially on the left, the importance of creating definitive lines of responsibility um, as to where you sit, where your contractor sits, where the manufacturer sits, where a surveyor sits, where an architect sits, um, beyond standard JCT contract is, is, is really paramount. Um, defining who's responsible for what part of the design or install should be made as clear as possible. But I certainly appreciate that's perhaps easier said than done. So the insurance market, what's next? We're getting right to the end now. Um, insurance market, what's next? More competition. And we've seen that this year already. So part of our job um, as a broker to, to the sector is making sure we're driving more competition to the market. Um, we had Andrew with us a, a couple of months ago now and um, presenting on our annual seminar where we get all the London market insurers, those that aren't even involved, put them in a room and say, right, okay, these are the hot topics. These are what, this is why the sector is improving. And we need more capacity in there to provide more competition to bring more appropriate premiums back into the back into the fold, as well as looking for increases in cover. Um, I've just mentioned their premiums. Premiums from five years ago, six years ago, won't be around for a long time. So it's not a case that we'd be promising that happens, but we certainly don't expect premium rate increases like we've seen. And we do see competitive premiums being achieved already this year, um, and certainly through the course of the next and into next year more so. So more competition means more competitive premiums. And then most importantly is it is the improvements to cover. And I appreciate most importantly might not seem entirely relevant for, for everyone on the call that has had to stomach what has been perhaps some tricky premium positions, but improvements to cover. So we're seeing things like the aggregate basis on PI, that improving to anyone claiming it, um, which is something we've achieved very recently um, for certain types of businesses. So we get more competition, we get more improvements on premium, We've then got more people providing more competitive premium. The next point is let's now get cover back to a position that allows our clients and the industry to start meeting their contractual obligations in more detail. So yeah, that brings me to the end. So I've, I've been through um, so today's market conditions, I reviewed what the professional demo policy is, reviewed the efficacy and the wider implications, working with your bona fide subcontractor networks. Um, some claims examples for you. Um, who needs PI? Who needs efficacy? Which I guess the long and short of that was probably everybody, but hopefully demonstrate um, some practical examples. And then what's next with the insurance market? So, um, any questions for me at all?
Um, at, at the moment, there's only one question on the on the on the question thing. Okay. Um, and it's and I'll be honest, it's some um, it's I was going to say, can I? I'll, I'll um, okay. Um, it, the the one question that's there is, could we could we make the slides available in a PDF form to somebody's email? Um, yes, and it's somebody that came on the on the presentation for about ten minutes and has disappeared off. Um, <laughs> so my usual my usual response to those would be. Um, we will upload the video of this onto the SOP website and you can freely access it from that, that if you want to access the content and have a look at it again at your leisure. Sure. OK. okay. Well, I guess I've got three then, haven't I? Um, I'll, I'll, well, I'll get, really, you say that. I was going to... I was going to... Oh, here we go. That, yeah. But that, that's... <laughs> um, number of occasions you mentioned the word safety critical for products. How we, How's the insurance industry defining safety critical um i guess there is no single definition because we wouldn't want to push a definition onto insurers but the principle that it's there to preserve um it's there to preserve life keep people safe um to prevent property damage or certainly limit property damage is probably where we have our insurers their understanding of it Okay, I mean the, the the reason for asking that is because there will be a definition of safety critical baked into Building Safety Act at some point, and I wondered whether you yeah. were to tie into to that or no. We've debated a number of different things over the years. Um, of, of you know, do we have insurers like the efficacy point that we, that we build? We keep it on a silent wording basis on purpose because if we, I don't want to pigeonhole insurers to a position where they, if a claim were to happen, they've got some angle to suggest that the claims payment would be seen through or they might not support a claim. So I think we will, I think that's inevitable. The more we see the insurers accepting Building Safety Act but for the time being, we are suggesting parameters for cover for insurers because we'd rather keep it open-ended. What um, do you, and then, and then beyond that is obviously, you know, very well that we're looking at doing stuff in terms of, the articulation of the definition and the demonstration of 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 competence for people yeah. who and, and manufacturers designers designers installers does yeah. do, do, do you see that having an impact on the insurance market and do you think that how do you see that being recognized if yeah that's a, good, that's a really good question. So it only gets recognised if we continue to try and improve that insurer, insurer and sector relationship because so much is being done that insurers don't see. Mm -hmm. um, and if a broker, anyone's broker, is not putting the right information in front of insurers to allow them to understand what's going on, then it's just a missed opportunity. So we do try and tackle that. And I'm not trying to say consort, you know, how brilliant we are but we do try to tackle that making sure insurers are aware of what's changing we keep them regularly updated um all all for the benefit of trying to show them it's an improving sector create that competition again so yeah it's um it, it, provided the the sector is given enough opportunities to educate insurers then it can only be a good thing okay okay all right Good. Oh, well, that's with that. One of the things I was hoping would come out of, of the competence work is the the fact that working with people like yourselves, we could, we could help that because because there's a there's sort of there's a big push in terms of um yeah. the, the, mm -hmm. the design and acceptance of that the tier ones want this development of like a new trade of a passive fire protection of people who are going to help them by designing and setting it all up. But mm -hmm. that sort of person, we need to we need to sh you know clear demonstration of how they are competent and or cover for them, so that we can sort of roll roll the whole role into into a, a thing. Um, there's an anonymous attendee question: Are there any fire insurance specific policies? Are you able to name a few of these? And if there are any fire insurance specific companies? Okay, um, fire insurance specific. I, you know, I don't want to plug myself here too much, but that is what consult is what we specialize in. So if you if you work in the sector, we are able to find you the, the policies that you need um, around efficacy that sits in the liability and then an appropriate professional indemnity policy. So by all means, please take my details um, if you'd like me to talk to you about a bit more. But if you were to go on Google and type in fire insurance, specific fire insurance, there might be options on there. 
Um, but there's there isn't a um, a one stop shop for it. Um, but I would say absolutely reach out to us and let us know how we can help if there's something that you've got you looking for cover for. But the most the most crucial part I would say take away from today, if you're looking to arrange an insurance program, regardless of the broker, is efficacy, failure to perform. Because if what you're supplying, what you're maintaining, what you're installing doesn't perform the function that it should, then you'd like the insurance support. Make sure it contains efficacy. Okay. Oh, Daniel, is there any activity amongst insurers to promote good practice to reduce premiums? So okay, that's probably where a broker comes into the position a bit more. So it's our responsibility to make sure that where the new insurers come into the market, that the, the current insurers are aware of what that means. So if we have a new player into the market, which we've had very recently um, on the professional indemnity side, it's then our responsibility to say, okay, Mr. Insurer that's been here for a number of years, I understand that you've been here and the support that you've been able to give is good, but you should be aware that there are insurers providing premiums of a, rel of a nature that is more competitive um, and it's something that you need to address also. It's a tricky, tricky game to, 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 to play as a broker, but it wouldn't be a case of, okay, last year this business spent £40,000. I've now got uh, insurer A providing terms at £20,000. You should be doing something here. We have to promote a healthy competition and also to make sure that insurer A that's been there for some time is going to be act reasonably for, for a number of years there afterwards. So it's, it's making sure that we're steering the market ourselves because we're the go-between between, between different insurers. Insurers may meet for different types of reasons, but I would not expect them to sit in the room and say, right, okay, I'm charging this, what are you charging? But us as brokers can certainly do that. So there is there is the uh, competition is changing. Um, market exercises for brokers should now start to feel um, more successful because they're able to negotiate from insurer to insurer and push each insurer to a better position. Um, but it's certainly the responsibility of the broker to make sure that happens. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that that's it for the there's there's no more open questions. Could I can I could I ask you if you can just drop the screen and I'll I'll share mine for a second. Yeah. A bit of it, or at least I'll try to. And but uh there we go. Hopefully you can all see that. Um so so there's the the, the end of the of the of the q a so i suppose that remains for me to say daniel thank you very much for your time i hope you I hope i found that interesting and there's there's there's, there's made me think about one or two things uh, and from an asap standpoint we'll continue to work with consult and as, as daniel mentioned we um we we joined in and we did a presentation at consort's annual um seminar in london at the start of the year explaining the good things that our members are doing to the wider insurance community trying to hopefully promote the fact that you know there are responsible actors out there doing the right thing to 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 that that are worth insuring and, and worth considering um remind if you all info at asfp.org.uk if you want your cpd certificate um and beyond that it's the usual um we've got a, a, a just just one slide which is in my contract that i have to do this this sort of thing at every, the end of every webinar otherwise georgina and max shout at me um, we've got the AGM is coming up on the 11th of April. Tickets are available through the ASF uh, through the ASFP website. Um, we've got Chandra who's coming down and giving us a uh, an update on where he's up to. Hopefully, an update on where he's up to with construction product regulations, as much as he can tell us. And that might be of interest to some of the manufacturers. It might even be of interest to you, Daniel. Um, we're doing a seminar in Scotland in 21st of May. And we're already planning um, our next London Aviva seminar. Well, it's what used to be the Aviva seminar in London. Um, this time it's at Burge Cape Walk, Westminster, because the Aviva building is no longer open to us. And we've got very well, we'll be putting a, a program together for that on the 10th of September. Chance to network and find out more about the developments in the industry. And um, with that, without any further ado, I think that's the time for us to wrap up. So, Daniel, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for the presentation. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. And um, we'll see you all. Hopefully, we'll see you all soon. Preferably, I you know I maybe on the eleventh of April, just after Easter. Have a good Easter holiday. Um.
Thanks a lot.